What's up, everybody? Sunday Sessions, episode 17, here to provide you with tons of tips and tricks on how to grow your business, how to grow your mindset, just how to improve yourself. Just 1% every single day, so each and every day you can become a better person, a better business owner, a better family man, family woman. Whatever you're looking to do, here's the place to find it. If you don't know who I am, my name is Eric Castellano. I'm a founder of Amazon Lit. Make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel because we're giving you tons of heat. Also, follow us on other social media. Catch you in the video. Stay lit. I want to know where you're from right here. I'm in Jersey at my warehouse hanging out. It's what, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I got a meeting to go to at 8.30. I figured I'd just hop on here, provide some value to y'all. So if you got any questions, just ask away. This is your time. All questions are warranted. There's really nothing I won't answer here. I'm live on Instagram, live on YouTube, and live on TikTok as well. So you can watch from all those platforms. What's up? We got Romania in the house, Orlando, California. Awesome, phenomenal. Utah. Where else we got? So this gentleman or Danielle or Daniel asked how to get ungated for certain products or categories. So when you go to add that product to your inventory, it will provide you with steps that you need to take in order to get ungated. It may ask for an invoice or brand approval, a letter from the brand, whatever the case may be, you just have to follow those steps. So I would just go back to that page and whatever it asks you to submit, then submit it. And if it's not allowing you to submit documents, then there's probably further restrictions that aren't allowing you to get ungated in that specific category. Maybe it's brand gated, they're not allowing any new sellers on there, whatever the case may be, you're gonna have to dig into that on the add a product page on Seller Central. They have no steps, so then it looks like you can't get approved. I would try resubmitting the request on another day, right? Sometimes Amazon systems go down, it just doesn't work, so what I would do is just try again tomorrow. And it might work, it might not, try again the next day, especially if it's worth it. You gotta put in that action. Favorite category? Probably grocery, health and beauty. I like, you know, summertime, I like pool toys. So I like to switch it up. My favorite, let me rephrase that. My favorite category is any category that makes me money. Let me put it that way. Uh, that's the categories I like. The categories that are making me that cash money, you feel me? Because it's like, I don't wanna be discriminative of any categories because that may limit my growth or limit your potential growth. If you're like, I don't like electronics or I don't like grocery category, like, nah, it's just put that emotion to the side and just sell in the categories that you can make money. That's what I highly recommend. Sell in the categories that you can make money. In. Nick, man, it was nice to see you in Vegas as well, my friend, appreciate you coming out. BGHL, for anybody who didn't get to go to Business Growth Tax Live 2021 in Las Vegas, about 200 of y'all showed up. We had about another 60 or 70 virtual attendees. It was amazing. We're already planning Business Growth Tax Live 2022. So keep an eye out for that. We'd love to have you attend. Thank you for letting us into the event in Vegas. Don't know it was 21 and under. Didn't know it was. Yeah, it was a last minute audible we had to pull we just had to ramp up the security and section off the bar, but we're happy we were able to get you in. You know, we never like to exclude anybody. So we appreciate you coming the distance and making it happen. And, and we're glad we got to sort that out. So thanks for being there. When are you doing an event in California? So we'll probably have an event in Anaheim. I'm thinking maybe beginning of 2022. It's crazy it's about to be 2022. That's just wild. Like the things that have changed in these past two years, it's crazy when you look back. Like the amount of time that went by. Watcher, what's up brother? I see you over there on TikTok. The amount of time that went by and just like the changes to the world and like what has happened, it's crazy if you ask me. How to tell distributors you're an Amazon seller. You tell them, I like to use the word e-commerce distributor. It just sounds cooler. It definitely sounds cooler. So instead of Amazon seller, I'll be like, yeah, I'm an e-commerce distributor. And then sometimes they just nod their head and other times they ask, well, what marketplaces do you sell on? And you wanna be transparent with these companies because you never wanna start a relationship off on a lie, right? Just like if you're going on a date and you meet a man or you meet a woman and you're going on your first date, right? Are you gonna tell them that you're an engineer when really 
you know, you work at Taco Bell or that you're a construction worker when really you own a car wash. Like you don't want to lie to these people because it's not going to form a good relationship. Now, on the flip side, there's some people who just want to get in your pants, right? And there's some people who just want to create accounts with distributors to make a quick couple thousand dollars. So they're not in it for the long haul. So they don't mind lying. That's not how I operate my business. I encourage you not to operate your business like that either because that's not how you grow a long-term relationship. Of course, you can lie to a distributor, make a couple grand here, a couple grand there. But A, all these distributors talk to each other. So you're going to get a bad reputation in the distribution space in the US, uh, which isn't good for business. And then you're going to miss out on potential long-term growth, which is what I'm looking for. What was your nine to five job before Amazon? Which one? <laughs> it's so many nine to five jobs. I was a construction worker. My first job ever, I worked at McDonald's. I worked at a car detailing shop. I was a pizza delivery driver. I worked at Muscle Maker Grill, which is like a health food place out here on the East Coast. I don't know if they have them out West. They do, I believe. I've done a lot of different jobs. Built decks, homes, so many things. Um, right before I started selling on Amazon, I was in and out of construction work, working construction here. I actually, one summer, or no, one winter, because it was cold, it was freezing outside, I installed fences. I installed fences in like the middle of winter. There was like two feet of snow on the ground. This guy needed the job done. He's like, you gotta go out there. I had these like winter boots on. We had to dig through the snow. The ground was frozen. We had these like jackhammers trying to hammer out the dirt. It was crazy. That was not a fun job. And the boss was just shitty, shitty fucking boss, right? One of the reasons why I don't, I don't like having, I don't like being a boss at all. You know, I like being a leader today because I've had shitty bosses and that guy was a prime example of a shitty boss, right? He was just, he didn't compensate me for the travel time. He'd be like, I'd have a job an hour away, right? And he would be like, um, yeah, meet me here, whatever, 8 a.m. So I'd get in the car, seven o'clock, get there at eight. Then we'd go to another job, another hour away, and then another job, 30 minutes away. And we'd work four jobs in one day. So for half the day, I was in the car driving because I'm going from job to job to job. And he wouldn't pay me for those hours. So it's like, really, I've been out for out of the house for 10 hours working, but he's only going to pay me for five and a half of them because the rest of the time I was driving. Like, that's just a shitty a shitty person. Don't be that person if you're a business owner. So David over here on the gram asked, how did we find our very first supplier? So Sebastian, it was about five and a half years ago. He took a chance and went to his first trade show out in San Francisco. I, for, I don't even think it's around anymore. You know, but we were doing the RA hustle for a couple years and we couldn't break a couple million dollars in sales. So he went to this trade show. He took a leap of faith and he went to this trade show and it worked out really well. We got our first distributor and we just been to the moon since, since then, you know? What label printer should I start with? I recommend just going all in. I wish I could show it to y'all, but we, this is the one we use, it's right here. The Zebra GK420D. I think this is the best printer on the market. I recommend having two of them at each station. One like this one to print FN SKUs, right? This one's printing FN SKUs. And then another one at the station to print box labels. So you got your GK420D for FN SKUs and then box labels, you feel me? So that's the one I recommend. That printer's, it's, it's about a $400 printer. It instantly sets you up, right? Or you could use, what's the other one? Uh, I wanna say Rolo, I don't think that's the brand though. Uh, all I know is there's one pr printer that sucks. It always breaks and I always hear people complaining about it. I don't know the name of it because we've just been using GK420Ds from day one. We have two, four, six, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. We have 14 of them in our warehouse printing stickers every single day and they've been doing this for seven years and we rarely have to replace them. Dymo, that's it. Dymo is a cheaper printer, but I've heard nightmares about Dymo printers. They're jamming and all that. It's the Zebra GK 420D. Yeah, I do remember the first product we sold on Amazon. It was Welch's Fruit Snacks, an 80 count from like Costco, I believe, or maybe it was BJ's, one of the wholesale clubs. Post more NFT stuff. Yeah, I, I definitely can do that. I went a little heavy, right? So I, I purchased this 
RTFTK, I believe, the shoe, which is used in like gaming, it's gonna become like a, a digital skin for gamers. I bought it for, I think, $3,000, like maybe 15 days ago, and I sold it for 20,000 a couple days ago. And then I got all excited and I, <laughs> I put all 20,000 on other NFTs, you know? I was just like, fuck it, I'm going all in. I turned three to 20, you know, $17,000 come up. Let me just, let me just go all in. And I, I bought a bunch of, you know, uh, Creature World and Hash Masks and then some other smaller ones, just YOLO in it. Uh, but yeah, a bunch of people have asked me, you know, I've definitely spent the past couple of weeks researching them. I'm by far no professional when it comes to NFTs, but I definitely have a little more knowledge than your your average newbie. And I will post more stuff about it. Even my mom called me yesterday. She's like, Eric, you're making money and you're not telling me? What do you use as a unique identifier for your products on the back end? And especially since one UPC GTIN can have multiple listings and the same UPC can be mapped to multiple bundles. So we will actually purchase UPCs from GS1 and use those as our unique identifier if we're creating a three pack or a six pack or a nine pack. Something you're gonna run into when you start doing that though is certain brands won't allow you to even create listings for their products. So that's just really a trial and error thing. And you'll get the hang of it. You'll, you'll begin to recognize brands that don't allow you to create new listings and stuff. So it comes with time and experience. Have you sold a product that only the brand is on the listing? We have, don't anymore because you usually get kicked off of it. It's like, why would you want to do that, right? The brand's got a good thing going and you're going to go in there and try to f screw it all up and like just mess with their brand and then they got to email you and try to kick you off and then you got to communicate with them. So it's just like, if they got their thing going on, just let them keep it going on, right? It's like, why well, you got to interfere with that? A good retail place to buy and sell, Home Depot, Walmart, TJ Maxx, some good retail places. Best way to prepare for Q4? This is a great question. This is right on par here for what's going on. We got Q4, it's what, a month away, right? It's early September. Make sure your inventory's healthy. So make sure you're analyzing any SKU that's been in stock for more than 90 days. Make sure you're looking at it and making sure that you have some sort of plan, whether it's dropping the price, losing some money on it, running an advertising campaign, running a coupon, making sure that inventory is moving because the last thing you want Amazon to do is if you're close to your restock limits is hit you with any additional decreases in your restock limits because that could be a nightmare for you, especially in the fourth quarter. You also want to make sure that your products are competitively priced for using a repricer. So you want to be using a repricer that's optimizing your chance of winning the buy box and then also you want to be diversifying the products that you're selling so some great sellers right around the holidays are like candies and and cookies and snacks and toys right all these little stocking stuffers and holiday things especially with thanksgiving around the corner in the u.s some canned products sell really well you know they'd be flying off the shelves because it's just so much easier to order some cranberry sauce on amazon than it is to go to the store and deal with the line so that's how you should really be preparing for Q4 and be sending in as much inventory as possible. Every year for the past six years or so, we see about a 20% increase in sales. So right now we're doing on average about 4 million. We'll, we'll probably break five during the fourth quarter. So if you're doing 100,000, you should be hitting, you know, 120, 125. It's pretty par for the course, a 40% increase. How to get the product lists from distributors at first, they are very skeptical to send you information. So you just gotta communicate with them. And this is why trade shows are very important because then you get to communicate with them in person, which is like game changer, game changer. A lot of you on this right now, you went to ASD with us and you saw how valuable meeting people in person is. But if they're skeptical, just talk to them. Ask them a lot of questions. If you see they're hesitant with the way they're presenting themselves, with their tone of voice or their lack of conversation, just ask them, hey, you know, it sounds like you're kind of hesitant to work with me. Uh, what's going on? What's with the hesitancy? Have you had a poor experience with other Amazon sellers? Are you currently working with Amazon sellers and you're disappointed with their capabilities? Because that's not how I operate my business. That's not how we do business over here. You know, we're very cooperative, we're very communicative, and we're willing to work with you. And anything you need from us, you just let me know and I'll take care of it. These are the type of things you wanna be talking about with these vendors. So they begin to trust you. And also you wanna spend money with them. Spend money. We appreciate you for the amazing content today. No problem, Serious Beats. How much for the forklift? 
You want to buy this, the Toyota? No, it's not happening. I don't know what we paid for that. We bought this forklift five years ago. We've had this thing. Is that a, is it the original? Yeah, I think it's the original forklift we bought five years ago. The tires are looking pretty haggard. I just looked at them. Tires are looking pretty haggard, but we got our money's worth. Maybe it was 10 grand. You know, we bought it used, so. Great seeing you at the Houston event, brother. We love all the knowledge you throw out there. Appreciate you, thanks for coming through to Houston. I've met a lot of you in person over the past couple months and years. A lot of you, very surprising to see a lot of you in person and then like get to know you. That's what it's all about for me. It's the human interaction. Don't get me wrong, I love doing what I do. I love selling on Amazon, but one of my favorite things and why I'm really leveraging it now is hosting live Live events because just getting everybody from all over the world in one room whether it's for three hours or eight hours or two days there's nothing that beats that right throw me a like on this video if you agree there's nothing that beats the power of networking and just interacting with other people who have the same mindset as you or even more intelligent than you that's even more exciting how do you feel about brands that sell directly on Amazon themselves but allow 3p sellers I'm assuming they want 3P to boost organic rank, then they kick everyone off, but not sure. No, so some brands, they can't handle Amazon by themselves, right? The thing about Amazon is you'll be able to sell for certain listings 1,000 units a month, 4,000 units a month, 10,000 units a month. Brick and mortar stores just don't move inventory like that. So a lot of these brands leverage third party sellers like myself and you to help with the volume that's happening on Amazon because they can't do it all themselves or a lot of them don't want to do it all themselves, but they want to be a presence on the listing so people recognize the brand and begin to make that connection with the brand and then do further research, check out their website, check out their Instagram, check out their TikTok, all that good stuff. So also brands will partner with its exclusive which really doesn't exist, but there's ways to manage and control these listings. They'll partner with, let's say, three 3P three sellers. So three third-party sellers, they'll be like, listen, we're gonna do business with you, we'll sell you our products, we'll sell you our products, we'll sell you our products. We want you all to be at this mat price, minimum advertised price, and then you know, you all will rotate the buy box and get some sales and help us grow our sales. And, and we'll sell on it too, but we, we won't break map either, and we'll all just kind of be a big old family there. A lot of companies like to do that. And and the way they control that, it's not on the Amazon end they control that. Usually it's on the distribution side that they control these listings because they're managing who gets their products in their hands and making sure third party sellers, only those three are getting the products in their hands. So that's really how they're managing those listings. And yeah, once in a while we'll jump on them, but we wanna do our research. Wanna click around on that keep a chart, make sure that whoever's winning the buy box consistently, it's rotating and it's different sellers than the three or the four that are on the listing right now. I'm going back a month, two months, four months, eight months, six months, and researching, clicking on those buy boxes on that Keepa chart and just checking for that information. How many people work with us? I think now it's like 48. Do I recommend raising prices when you're running out of inventory? I do recommend raising prices when you're running out of inventory. Uh, so there's two scenarios. One, you're the only seller on the product. It's a private label product. And then I think raising the prices and slowing down sales is better than going out of stock. I firmly believe that to be true and that's what we do over here. If we're like 10 days out from our next replenishment and you know we got five days worth of inventory, I'll slow down sales, raise it two or three dollars to try to make a little more money and not have the product sell out because the worst thing is to have a customer go to Amazon and they want your product and they can't find it. Right? You might potentially lose that customer forever. Also, when it comes to wholesale listings or RA listings, basically piggyback listings, listings where there's multiple sellers on these listings. It really depends on, on how much inventory they have, what price point they're at. If I'm running low on inventory and I know I can raise my price a dollar or two, still get a few sales a day just to kind of prolong my in-stock rate and keep it in stock for just a couple more days waiting for that replenishment and I can make a few more dollars on it, absolutely I'll do that. Roby, so 17 years old, how do you start? You go to the link in our bio and you click it and a few options down it says beginners bundle click that beginners bundle and uh you know get it watch it do everything it says and you'll be set up how were you able to scale so this is a great question for anybody who's looking to kind of grow their business initially i recommend leveraging credit cards right taking 
three, four credit cards out, preferably. There's some credit cards with grace periods like American Express Plum Card that has a 60 day grace period. Also looking for credit cards with points and rewards so you're getting rewarded for your spending because if you're doing a wholesale RRA, you could be spending you know tens if not hundreds of thousand dollars a month. That's a lot of bonus points you're getting for free travel which I recommend using for personal travel and not business travel. Always put your travel for business on a business credit card and use the points you get for either cash back or personal travel. That's what we did. I just booked the flight yesterday to Houston next week and I used, it's a personal trip, not business, and I used my business credit card point. But yeah, so credit cards and then you got some options, family investments, right? Other investors, uh, which is kind of hard to get by if you don't know anybody with some deep pockets. And then you could leverage business bank loans or SBA loan, which is actually a loan backed by the government. Very low interest rate. I'm talking one or two points above prime, which would be like three to 4% interest. You could also leverage Amazon lending, which is huge. So you got some options out there or you just keep flipping inventory. How do you deal with burnout? I set a good goal and I got it. Now I feel burnt out. Set new goals, set higher fucking goals, set bigger goals, right? You, you make a goal. First of all, if you're making goals consistently and you're crushing them, your goals aren't big enough, right? I like to set two goals in my life. One goal that I always like, all right, reasonably achievable if I take serious action and then just one crazy goal, crazy goal. And that crazy goal is what I'm shooting for. And in the midst of shooting for that crazy goal, that super outlandish, way out there goal, I'm definitely gonna crush my regular goal. It has to happen. It just has to happen. Yeah, and uh, dealing with burnout, you gotta take time. I just learned this recently from some health issues I was having from working, you know, 70 hours a week and not focusing on my personal health and my mental health and my physical health and my spiritual health. Kind of went off the rocker there for a little bit. And I would encourage you, you know, step away from the business. You know, I was able to take like a month and a half off and not fully off, I started working from home probably halfway through, but it was nice to be able to kind of detach and like, you know, I've never been a big vacation taker, but now I know why people do it because you're able to separate yourself from the day to day. So it's nice to go away for a long weekend or 10 days or even two weeks and just separate yourself from the day to day of the business to really fix what's going on up here and in here. Because if up here and in here aren't okay, then all this isn't going to be okay. All this is going to be out of whack and out of sort if you're not focusing on what's in here and what's in here. You got to focus on this and also what's here, right? You got to focus on your physical health as well. So those are just some tips that I use to kind of keep me grinding every day. And then at the forefront of every single day and every action I participate in is gratitude because gratitude is an action word, my friend. Gratitude is an action, right? You can't just be grateful. You have to show your gratitude through action, whether that's giving back, helping somebody else, thanking somebody. Like attitude is an action word. It's a verb, right? What was that? That, uh, uh, schoolhouse Rock, uh, the action word, our uh, verbs, right? I don't remember, yeah, Schoolhouse Rock maybe, but like a little jingle, right? I know my verbs, so gratitude. Long, long story short, fucking gratitude, my friends. Anyway, listen, I gotta break out of here. It's been a pleasure. Sunday Sessions, episode 17. If you're not subscribed to the channel, make sure you smash that subscribe button. Catch you on the flip side. Keep an eye out. We might be in a city near you. Coming very soon. Have a beautiful evening. And most importantly, my friends, stay grateful and stay lit. Adios.